welcome you all. If you would turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Luke, New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. And once again, Mr. Jackson, I need to uh, ask you for that pew Bible number. Let's just start with one. That's 857. 857. Once again, I forgot in my haste. In your pew Bible, there's a little blue book in front of you. It's our pew Bible. If you turn it, 857. You join us in Luke. Chapter 7, verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Luke 7, 1 says, When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, a highly valued slave of a Roman officer or centurion was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy for such an honor. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under authority of my superior officers. And I have authority over my soldiers. I only need say, go, and they go. Or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Wow, what does it take to amaze Jesus? Huh, anyway, I'll, I'll read on a little bit. Jesus was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to the house, they found the slave completely healed. How you like that? Pretty cool, huh? You guys know me. You know what a fan I am of Jesus. He is extraordinary. He is my hero. He's cooler than James Bond, Superman, and Batman all rolled up into one. He is my absolute hero. And uh, this story, I want to talk to you about another story because these good stories always often come in twos. But I want you to, to go with me back in time to the first century. Rome had taken over just about everything. And they didn't always do it in a nice way. There were soldiers who would just walk into your house, make themselves a sandwich, sit down on your couch, get your remote control, and watch whatever program they wanted to watch. No, that's not exactly true, but you get the point, right? You can imagine if they just barged into your house at any time, at all hours, and if they were tired, they would say, hey, DJ, pick up my bag and follow me. You don't even know how many miles. And you had to drop everything and do whatever that soldier told you to do or else. So... Just if you could put yourself back at these times, these Romans were not popular among the Jews. They were not nice generally. Well, Jesus is going about his business, and he's up near the Sea of Galilee in a very well established Roman community called Capernaum. And who comes to him but some Jewish leaders from that area? Hey, we come to you, Jesus, on behalf of a Roman centurion. And everybody following him was probably saying, oh, fat chance of that happening. He's a Roman. We don't like Romans. We do not associate with Romans. Romans, bad. Jesus, good. Romans, bad. Right? So they're probably saying, okay, Jesus, tell them where to go. Tell them you don't do this. Right? These are bad, awful, crazy people. They're bullies. Right? So Jesus was willing to go. And they said, listen, 
this Roman soldier, he's good. He has done some amazing things. He even helped us build a new synagogue. Huh, that is rare. Uh, from what I understand, uh, in, in the first century, especially during the early church uh, and, and into the, the Jewish era, there was what was called God-fearers. They respected God, but they weren't going to do this, and they especially weren't going to become Jews. They didn't want to become Jews, even though they worshipped or they respected the God of Israel, but they were hesitant about a certain snip-snip kind of operation. I'll just leave your imaginations on that. There may be children listening. They didn't quite want to do that. So they just were called God-fearers. They just, they helped from a distance, right? And this is probably the case with this Roman centurion. So, and the slave or the servant in his house was probably a Jew. I think most, most certainly he was a Jew. So he was, this Roman, this nasty bunch of people, they were good to the Jews, and this was rare. I read in uh, Matthew's account, in, uh, he told the same story from a different point of view, in Matthew 8. And uh, the, the people who were with Jesus, they weren't, they weren't for this. They didn't think this was a good idea. But Jesus got up and said, okay, let's go. Wait a minute. Jesus didn't understand social barriers. Jesus didn't respect, I mean, he, he would talk to a Samaritan. He would talk to a woman. Hey, you don't do these things in the first century. If you're a good Jew, there's certain things you do not do. But Jesus didn't care. Uh, Jesus didn't have any kind of class preference. He loved everybody. He worked for everybody. And he was not a racist. You know, he didn't care where you lived, what color you were and everything. He knew your heart. He knew your need. And he was more than willing so Roman asked him to come heal his servant, and Jesus got up and was on his way. How do you like that? That would be a good sermon just in itself. But hold on. As Jesus is getting closer to the house, you can imagine some of his disciples thinking, what is he doing? Why would he go to a house of a Roman? We don't do that. Jesus was, was on his way, and he was almost there. And they stopped him and says, no, no, no. The master of the house said, He's not worthy that you enter under his roof. I mean, this guy's humble, right? He says, you don't even have to, to talk to me face to face because I'm just not worthy. But I know that God hears you. I know God will answer you because I, this, this Roman soldier said this, I am under authority. And when my boss or my generals or my captains tell me to do something, I go do it. That's the way it works. And I have at least 100 men under me, a centurion. He, he would be in charge of at least 100 men. And uh, if I tell one to go, he goes. He better, or he's going to feel my wrath. Well, they go. If he says come, they come. This Roman understood how hierarchies work. He understood how authority worked. And he knew this guy, this Jesus, was exceptional. He knew that he had a history of miracles. Right? So he said... All you need to do, Jesus, is say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled. That's what the, the King James said. He just marveled. How often do you see Jesus amazed or marveling? I can't really think of, besides this, any place. Jesus shook his head and he says, do you see this? Do you see this? This guy isn't even a Jew. He's not a Christian because there weren't Christians yet. They were going to be. But he said, I have not found faith like this anywhere in all of Israel, in all of Ju Judea, anywhere, in all of Jerusalem, anywhere. Can, can, can you listen to this? Wow, this is something. And this just makes me pause for a minute, bringing this back to the 21st century. That was what faith really, really, really was back then, what is faith today? Knowing what we know. You know, they were still figuring this Jesus out. It was, this was all new to them. After 2,000 years of learning and book studying and preaching and all that, what do we know about Jesus? How much do we trust him? You know, do we really think that he can do a miracle in this day and age? I've actually heard educated Christian people say, well... God does not do miracles anymore. 
Seriously, I've heard that from pulpits in America. Well, now that we have the canon of Scripture, the 66 books, there's no need for the miraculous. There's no need. Uh, God doesn't do healings anymore. He doesn't do, you know, make limbs grow out. He doesn't raise the dead anymore. He just doesn't do it. Right? Well, I think otherwise. You know, it's getting back to faith. Faith is profound trust. Who is the most trusted person in your life? What is the most trusted institution in the world today? Uh, basically, there really aren't any. <laughs> you can only take it so far with a grain of salt, right? I mean, this thing we call the church, really? There's not a whole lot of people who trust the church. Because this thing called churchianity seems to have taken over Christianity. Churchianity is a bunch of rules, regulations, a bunch of condemnation, a bunch of this, wear your hair like this, carry this Bible, you better wear this, and not go here. You know, and it's a lot of rules, rules, rules. And a lot of people, they don't want the rules. And when they come to church, they get nothing. There's no more spirit there. There's just a bunch of words thrown at them that they don't understand. And, and they hear it, and they're not getting a darn thing from it, so they just go on their way. Christianity is not churchianity. Christianity is following Jesus. The words of Jesus are not only true, they are powerful. The person of Jesus and a relationship with him is life-changing. And it is miraculous. I mean, if you want to say any miracle, the greatest miracle on planet Earth is a changed heart and a changed life. And I am living proof of a miracle right here. I used to be one way, but I'm no longer that way. What changed me? None other than Jesus. It was not churchianity. It wasn't no guilt trip. It wasn't somebody beat me over the head with a King James Bible and hold me under the water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit until I almost drowned. You ready yet? No, okay. No, that didn't change me. It was a relationship with the Jesus, the man, whose total mission was to come into this world of, I'll just say it, confused people. Lost people. I don't know, they act like they know it all. They act like they're found, but they're lost. And they ain't never going to find their way. God came through Jesus to give us the assist. He came and he lived a life out loud. And he spoke words like nobody ever spoke before. And when that Jesus, when that word gets into you, it can change you and transform you. And that, folks, is the miracle. I mean, I've, I've prayed to God. I've sought the Lord over the years. And he's done astounding things in my life. You're looking at a true believer. Faith, you get a little bit of that from the Lord. It's a gift that he gives you. But that faith that he gives you, it can grow. And it can change you. And it can make you different. Religion will never do that. Churchianity will never do that. Only a genuine Jesus relationship can do that. Do you agree with me on that? Right? The church, the church has taken a bad rap. I know a lot of folks have just stopped going to church altogether because the church did this, or somebody in the church said that, or whatever. You know what? Jesus never did you wrong. Jesus never forgot your birthday. Jesus never meant to insult you or step on your toes in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, he wants to straighten you up. Yeah, we need to change and grow up. But he does it because he loves you. He doesn't do, you to, do that to beat you down. So when he gives you that little bit of faith, and the closer you go, the closer you go, your faith grows. And faith is a wonderful thing. And Jesus is showing us. And Jesus is acknowledging. Do you hear this guy? Do you hear this Roman? That dares faith. Do you trust the Lord? You trust him a little bit, and he'll show you. Then you trust him a little bit more, and he shows you again. Faith is an ongoing process. Faith is growing. Faith is abiding. And our dear friend James, later in the Bible, who talks about it, goes, you say you have faith? Prove it. Put it 
on the line. We will find out who trusts God and who doesn't through this course of life, won't we? Old story. Some of you heard it. My wife's heard all my stories. Sorry, dear. Here it comes again. Niagara Falls. Anybody ever been there? It's a scary place. It's loud. My wife took me there in the middle of winter because she wanted to see it in the snow. I did not. She did. So I'm there by Niagara Falls and my glasses froze. I couldn't see out of them. She's happy as a lark. Oh, oh, pretty. I'm like, I'm miserable. So I take off my glasses and I put them in my pocket because they're just useless. They're frozen. And then my eyes started watering. And my eyes froze shut. I couldn't see a darn thing. And I'm so miserable. And she points up at this big tower up there. It's an observation deck. She goes, let's go up there. And I finally broke down and I turned into a weeping little girl. I says, I don't want to go to the tower. I broke down. I had a meltdown there. But uh, <laughs> funny story. Getting back to my original. <laughs> yes, I did because I'm a good husband. And I was miserable. She was happy. I was not. Anyway, marriage counseling 101. So <laughs> why am I bringing up Niagara Falls? I'd heard, this is a true story that maybe back in the 1800s, early 1900s, there was a guy who was braver than brave. He ran a line across the Horseshoe Falls from America to Canada. Anybody ever heard of this? Do you know his name? I don't know. I remember his name. Anyway, he, was, he would walk back and forth on that tightrope over the falls. That is scary business. I would not not do that. Well, apparently... Uh, he got what looked like a wheelbarrow, and he would push that wheelbarrow back and forth between America to Canada, Canada to America, and people, crowds, wow, you are brave. So one time, I think he was on the American side, he says, how many of you in this audience think that I can do this again, that I can push that wheelbarrow from America all the way to the Canadian side? And everybody in there, oh yeah, we know you can do it. He goes, okay, who wants to get inside the wheelbarrow? <laughs> suddenly their faith wasn't so great. You see, that's a funny story, true story. Nobody got in the wheelbarrow, right? So you say, oh yeah, I love the Lord, man. I trust him with all my heart. Yeah, okay, we'll get in the wheelbarrow. Whoa, now the rubber's meeting the road. Do I really trust him? James says, you trust the Lord, do you? Oh, so you do. Get in the wheelbarrow. Put it all on the line, man. Are you following the Lord? Do you trust Him? Let's just see. This is what life does to us. It stretches us. It proves. It separates the men from the boys. It surely does. And uh, the night that Jesus was betrayed, where did those 12 disciples go? Well, one of them flat out betrayed Him for money. The rest of them, no, they talked a good game, but they, they all ran for their lives. They came back together later. One of them even denied him three times. His best friends. Faith. Oh yeah, I got the faith. But when it comes down to it, what do you got? Well, Jesus restored every single one of them. Isn't that a miracle? Jesus, the, except Judas, of course. Those 11, they came together and they ended up giving their very lives. Except John, he lived to a ripe old age. They showed their faith. After the spirit, after the miracle of Jesus in their hearts came, their faith became their life, and their faith drove them, and they took it to the very end. That is real faith. I mean, I've been a Christian for over 40 years. God has proven himself to me over and over again, and he still does it every day. I don't want to go into my old stories of all I've been through, but God loves you. Jesus is with you. And he's willing to prove it. Are you willing to call on him? Are you willing to trust in him like this Roman soldier did? Where'd this guy get the faith? I don't know. But he sure had it. How do I know? He proved it. Don't even come under my roof. Just say the word. And from that very hour, that servant was healed. Something amazing about the heart of God. Something is amazing when Jesus arrives on the scene. Jesus honors faith. Even if you have the grain of a mustard seed, 
a great thing can come from that little mustard seed. So wherever you're at in your life, if you've got a mustard seed faith, that's a good place to start. You test the Lord. You show. You, you put him to the... He will prove himself to you over and over. Precious Jesus. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I'm going to read you another story. Don't leave yet. Anybody willing to get in my wheelbarrow? It's not Niagara Falls, but hey, we could try that railing there. Let's start there, and then we'll end up in Niagara Falls. How about it? Nobody's with me. Okay, I don't blame you. If you read verse 11, chapter 7, verse 11. This is the second little story. Before we go over and eat, I can hear your bellies growling already. Stick with me. Chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterwards, after Jesus had healed this fella, soon afterwards Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, which is south of there, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. A young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. I had learned a few things uh, about Jewish history uh, recently. In the, in the uh, country of Israel, Judea and Samaria, when there was a funeral procession, people would stop traffic to let the procession go past. Still happens today. You know, the vehicles with the, the flag on, on the, you know, the magnetic flags on the front of the vehicle, they let them go. This is an old custom. Out of respect, if you were going into town and a procession was coming out, you would stop and allow them to go by. Unless there was a marriage procession. In Israeli custom, life precedes death, so the funeral procession would have to stop while the marriage procession went by. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Well, suppose the funeral stopped and the wedding was going by. What would they do if a royalty, a, a prince or a king was coming by and they wanted to go through? Guess what? The wedding would stop and the funeral would stop to let the king or the prince go through. That is the order of things. Did you know that? Do you even care? <laughs> That's just the way it used to be. So if you're in a funeral and the king comes along, you've got to stop. Whatever. Anyway, so Jesus, with a large crowd of people, is coming to the city of Nain. Okay? And the funeral procession was coming out, and it was a bunch of very, very sad people. You see, this poor woman, she was a widow. And her only helper was her boy. And her boy had tragically died. And you can imagine how sad and how horrible this sad procession is coming out of town. And Jesus interrupts a funeral. Can you believe that? I just turned into Jimmy Durante there. What the heck happened to me? Anyway, listen. A large crowd from the village was with her, the widow. Verse 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. That is an amazing word, compassion. You know, having pity on somebody, gee, I really feel bad for them. What a shame. You know, well, let's get on with our lives, right? Pity, it's a heartfelt thing, but pity doesn't act. Compassion acts. Compassion does something. Compassion sees a family that's got burned out or sees somebody going through a hard time and does something. It moves, it acts. And Jesus' heart is overflowing with compassion. He's going to do something. What do you think of this? Huh? So this is what happens. He said, don't cry. Wait a minute. You know the situation here. This is tragedy the, the most tragic thing that could happen in a family. And you're telling us, don't cry. You better have the goods. You better be able to back this stuff up. This is nuts. This is not normal. What's going on here? A guy comes to town. He interrupts a funeral procession. Nobody does that unless you're getting married or unless you're royalty. Hmm, is Jesus royalty? Maybe so. Anyway, listen to what he does. 
Don't cry, he said. He walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. The pole bearers and the whole funeral stops. This is unheard of. This is not normal. What is going on here? God just showed up in human form. Let's read on. He touched it, and everybody stopped. Young man, Jesus said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Can you think of a more heartfelt, wonderful miracle on planet Earth? This is the heart of God. Nobody is praying. Nobody said that I, that I read of in Scripture. God just saw the situation and he acted. He went into motion. He went to work on it. I hear from pulpits, oh no, God can't do nothing unless you have faith. Oh no, God can't do nothing unless you specifically ask. He'll just sit back and wait. and You know, well, he's a gentleman. He does that, but he doesn't have to. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, because he's great, he's holy, and he's sovereign. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you see the Father. God's will is life. God's will is miraculous. His will is goodness. His will is compassion. You know why I say that? Because I see Jesus here, moving and acting in his time. He interrupted a funeral. Who does that? I mean, there's been crackpots out there who have done it. And guess what? They got nowhere. All they did was embarrass themselves and make a stupid show of things, right? Jesus didn't do that. He's got the goods. If you're going to stop a funeral, you better have the goods. And he does to this day. He is the author of life. He is the author of blessing. He is the author of compassion. He is God. And this is God's will for you to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. So don't feel put out. If God's on the scene, good things are going to happen. So Jesus is on the scene. He presents himself, I'm sorry, he presents the dead boy back to his mom. A greater, a great, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 16. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea. And they surrounded Judea and the surrounding countryside. Amazing, isn't it? But I learned something else this week. Do you want me to share it with you? Sure, Tom, go ahead. Oh, thank you for that vote of confidence. That little voice. <laughs> well, right over the hill from Nain, long time ago lived a Shunammite woman. We just learned about this. The, the lovely and talented Keith Haney just taught us that in our Wednesday night Bible study. Shumanite or Shuman, whatever. How do you say her name? Shumanite. Shunammite. Shunammite. Ah, anyway, she had a son, and he passed away tragically. And the prophet Elisha came and raised him up just over the hill from Nain. And he was renowned as a great prophet. Well, not even five miles from there, Jesus showed up. Jesus did a healing. Jesus raised somebody from the dead. Surely a great prophet has risen among us. Again, this is God moving. This is Jesus showing up. So what do we say about this? Does God like funerals? Well, the, 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 this whole thing with, about death, it came through rebellion. Way back in the garden. Don't eat that fruit. Don't even touch it. Don't mess with it. And we messed with it. I, I won't say Eve did it. We did it. We're all there. We're all guilty. None, none perfect here, right? All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. 
We need a Savior. And the Savior is here in this story. He's showing us who He is. He is a God of compassion. He acts. He sees your situation. And He rises to the occasion and He shows us a miracle for His glory. That is God. Uh, churchianity doesn't talk too much about that. Churchianity will tell you, well, straighten up and fly right, and then maybe God will listen to you. And maybe God might visit you. He might show up. Uh, you know what? <laughs> God sees you. He sees you in your sin. He sees you in your pain. He sees you in your discomfort. He sees you in your question. He sees you when you're so afraid your mind is blown. He sees you. If you don't believe me, ask Mary Magdalene. He saw her in her distress. He sees you in yours. And he says to you, come. Like that song we sang a little bit further, a little bit earlier. Come. Come to me. Come as you are. I absolutely love you. We'll, we'll address this together. We'll heal you. We'll resurrect you. We'll do something great together. This is the relationship. This is Christianity, not that churchianity stuff. This is our God. This is our Jesus. These two stories. Jesus loves faith. But Jesus doesn't necessarily need it. Jesus is showing us above it and beyond it his power and his glory and his compassion. Whatever you're going through, wherever you are in your life, Invite Jesus in that situation. He's already there waiting for you to ask. He's all over it. He's with you and he absolutely loves you and he will do stuff. I can seriously tell you so many stories of how God has intervened in my life and how he showed me such good things. You know, and many of you have heard it and my wife's heard it a million times, <laughs> but God is alive. And he is love and he is compassionate. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right, I'm going to stop there because we got a dedication to do, uh, a beautiful uh, kitchen that we've uh, renovated because of the beautiful donations we've received on behalf of Nancy Cooper, a great soul who I, I, I knew her, she would roll her eyes at me. <laughs> like, what are you doing, Tom? What do you say? Come on. But she still loved me. And she was always over there in that kitchen doing great stuff for us. So we want to dedicate a beautiful thing over there. Uh, I, we want you all to come over and see it. Even if you can't stay, come over and take a look at it. It's, it's just awesome. So many nice people have donated stuff in the name for Nancy. And uh, we got it done. And we're very proud of it to show you all. So before I dismiss you, I'd like to say a prayer over you. And then we'll meet you all over there. Would that be okay? Does anybody need a, to go over there sooner? Okay. They're already over there. Okay. Please bow your head and close your eyes. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your miracle working power. For it is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Whether we have faith or not, you are great and you are good. It's good to have faith, Lord, and we want to, and we want to grow in it. But you are on the job, and you are all over this, and we do love you. We pray for our nation, that you would heal us and get us back in line. For our state, for our communities, and for our families, Lord. Help us, heal us, and bring us back to yourself. And Father, as we are dismissed, I would like to pray this over the people for them and their families and their neighborhoods. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for listening. And please be blessed. You're dismissed. Hope to see you over there. <laughs>